Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Charlemagne the God. We are the Breakfast Club. We have Lauren LaRosa, our special guest host, and we got a special guest in the building, ladies Big and gentlemen. Big legend energy. <laughs> Kerry Washington. That's right. Welcome. Hi. Yes. Good morning, Miss Washington. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Congrats Carrie, on the, on Carrie's the new book. Good. Okay. Yeah. Carrie, Thank how, you. How are you? First. I'm of all. really good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm good. Good. Okay. Yeah. Thank new you book for out. Thicker than water. Congratulations. Thank you. Learned so much about you uh, with this book. First, it, it, maybe it's just me being stupid. I didn't know you were from the Bronx. Really? I did, I did not oh, know that. Yeah. From the Bronx. I didn't know you were from the Bronx. Born yeah. and raised in the born Bronx. And, born and raised. Where I mean, at? my mother was born in the Bronx. My mother grew up on Simpson Street, um, and I grew up on Pugsley Avenue across from Stevenson High School. You know what I say? I say the craziest people in America come from the Bronx and all of Florida. Why? What? Why? Have you seen the news? <laughs> 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 I, I agree on Florida. <laughs> But why the Bronx? And people I think from the Bronx some of the most think... talented people that is true in the too. world come from the Bronx. That is very true, yeah. too. Now, how did you know now is the time to write Thicken in Water? So um, what I write about in the book is that a handful of, like five years ago, my parents sat me down and um, shared with me some new information about myself mm -hmm. that really kind of challenged the way that I thought about myself, that I thought about my family, turned my world upside down. And at the time, I had actually sold another book idea, which was based, kind of inspired by the show that I was on Scandal. And it was mm -hmm. like, these are the 10 things that I learned from Olivia Pope. So that mm -hmm. was a really fun, kind of self-reflective, but not very deep, deep, soul-searching book. But every time I sat down to write that book, all I could think about was this new information I'd been given and how it impacted my family and my sense of self. And so I wasn't going to write a book at all. I tried to give the publisher their money back, but they wouldn't take it. Wow. Um, wow. And then a few years later, I was like, I think I have to at least try to write this book. Because you said your parents didn't want you to reveal that information. Yeah, yeah. So my, you... my, my parents told me that they were sort of forced to tell me that my dad is not my biological father. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did that affect you? Because I mean, he's still your dad at the end of the day. We've he seen the pictures. We've be seen my you, dad. you know the him dad dancing jokes and on the dad. Instagram. Yeah. 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 So, so how did that affect anything after you were told? So I think immediately when they told me, um, it was weird. I, to be totally honest with you, I felt like excited. I felt excited and grateful mm -hmm. because. I had always felt like there was something going on in my family that I couldn't put my finger on, but it was like a dynamic of distance or like um, there was, I just knew that, I didn't know what I didn't know, but I knew that, that there was something between my parents and I. And because I didn't know what it was, a lot of times I blamed myself for that um, or maybe thought I was crazy for thinking it, maybe thought I, maybe I'm just not open enough. Like I, I, I was always trying to figure it out. So when they told me, it felt like, I don't know, it felt like I could breathe. It felt like, oh, this is this is a real opportunity for me to jump into this new kind of understanding of mm -hmm. myself and my life. And, you know, it was it was really exciting. Did you care? Because it's, you know, it I did care. I did care because I did care, partly because I felt like, yes, my dad is always going to be my dad. But the reality is now 50% of my genetics became a big question mark. Mm. And that's important, right? Like in terms of health care, in, you know, in terms of understanding my medical history. Mm -hmm. But even like, you know, I don't know what I might get. You know, in the whole nurture versus nature dynamic, mm -hmm. there might be parts of me that I get from this donor, this sperm donor, that, that I've never known was from that side of my family. Like I just thought, this. I, I guess... Partly, I've I've struggled to feel comfortable in my skin for most of my life. It's part of why mm -hmm. acting has kind of saved me. Mm -hmm. is because I always, I would find myself in these characters. I would kind of grab onto their identities, and there was like a a sense of freedom and wholeness in becoming other people. But this felt like an opportunity to try to be comfortable in my own skin. When you would ask questions about like just different things, like hey. Uh, you go to the doctors and they say, you know, what illnesses are on your mom's side, mm -hmm. your dad's side. When you would ask your dad and your mom those questions, how would they answer it? As if my dad was my father. Mm -hmm. wow. They were going to take this to their grave. And I, I get it. I totally understand, right? Like, they protecting you? Yeah. They, I think they, they felt like, well, first of all, 
let me just say this. My parents are renegades, right? Like a lot of us now, we know people who go to sperm donor sperm banks, right? It's like very common mm-hmm. relatively now. And you get a whole catalog. You can pick the color of the eyes mm-hmm. and right. what Ivy League university they went to. But when my parents did this in the mid-70s, nobody was doing this. Mm-hmm. This was highly experimental, highly secretive. It was a big risk they were taking. It wasn't like they had complete health screenings for the donor. They had no idea who the donor was. Mm. They said we asked two things. Let him be healthy. Who knows what that means at the time, right? But, like, we want him to be healthy and we want him to be black wow. because they wanted this to be a secret. Um, so, yeah. yeah. There, there's, are you okay? Yeah. You okay. I I'm thought you were getting a little you emotional. Yeah. yeah because, cause... you know, sometimes we put things in these books and, you know, we, we bare our souls. Yeah. But then we got to go on these press runs and we yeah. may not be ready to talk about these mm-hmm. things. No, yeah. yeah. It's interesting because I actually feel like. I think I am a little bit emotional today because it's the book is really out in the world. But um, I I think I'm having an easier time processing it than a lot of people because I've been living with it for five years, mm-hmm. right. you know, o- over five years. So and for other people, it's, it's very new information. Um, but I feel. You know, every time I talk about it, I feel a little bit more liberated. Mm-hmm. Like I feel a little bit more free. I but, wanted to ask, you know. You know, you talk about uh, your eating disorder and dealing with how you felt about your body and your looks. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to know what got you in that point. And the reason I ask is I have four daughters. Charlemagne has four daughters. Uh, and I always want to make sure I try my hardest to give my daughter as many compliments as possible. Right. Because yeah. you never want them to feel that way. But sometimes I don't think that matters because it's also how they look at themselves. Yeah. So what got you to that point where you didn't like what you seen in the mirror or something that you weren't happy about it's such a good question I have daughters too right so it's something that I think about a lot I I think that the food it's like any other kind of addictive behavior it's not about the drug it's not really about the food or even really about the relationship with body it came from a compulsion to try to fix my to it came out from a compulsion of trying to escape the feelings I was having Mm -hmm. or numb them. Um, And so I think for me, it was this sense that I write about in the book of feeling like I had to be perfect. Um, Like I had to be better than who I was in order to be deserving of love. And some of that came from like, why, why, why do I have this weird dynamic with my parents? Like what's going on? Maybe if I was better, prettier, smarter, Mm -hmm. Um, thinner, then then I might be more lovable. So I don't even, you know, I mean, I do think like we, it's important to teach our kids to make healthy choices when it comes to exercise, to make healthy choices when it comes to food, to teach them about nutrition, about how food works in the body. All that's important. But I think helping a kid to feel unconditionally loved, mm-hmm. to feel safe physically and emotionally, like those, and to help a child have their feelings and process their feelings and not feel like they need to escape their feelings, those are the things that I think help us have the tools to live in life on life's terms as opposed to grabbing at addictive behaviors to escape life. Are you are you your parents' only uh, child? I am. Wow, so you went through this like kind yeah. of alone even though they were still there yeah, with Yeah, there you. was a lot of pressure, yeah. I mean, I think that was one of the big things for me is when I was in college and the food stuff got really bad and I just was, that was really the first time that I started to ask for help. Because I think up until that time, I felt like self-reliance is the point. Like you're supposed to kind of go it alone, be strong, get through life. And that was the turning point for me where I was like, I think I need some help. What did you ask first? Did you ask your parents? Um... Trying to think. I think I asked an aunt. I I called an aunt of mine first and was like, I think I have a really messed up relationship with food. But the thing, what's hard about eating disorders is a lot of people will tell you, like, oh, everybody eats when they're depressed or everybody goes to the gym when they're upset. That's okay. But I knew, like, to the level, to the extent that I was in that behavior, that it was self destructive. I knew this wasn't just like a cute sitcom, you know, kids on a sitcom eating a little ice cream because they were sad. Like, this was. This was a different level of of pain. What was your go to? Anything. Mm. Anything. Was it but, fast food or Yeah, I guess so. I was in college. So it was okay. like normal stuff you can get your hands on in college, like pizza and but really again, like it wasn't about the food, right? Mm. It was about the the numbing and the yeah. Why not drugs or alcohol? 
Not well, saying that's, that's better. That's a good question. That's a good question. There's, question. Question. There's time. There's time for me. Lord. I can go there. <laughs> Lord, Lord have mercy. I think, you know, it's funny. It's like I couldn't be a perfectionist and and do the drugs and alcohol thing. Like I still, the thing about the eating disorder and you the exercises, yes, I could hide it. So I could still be a great student, maintain my GPA, mm. be seen as a perfectionist, still have the lead in all the plays in college, mm. still come across as a good girl, but secretly have this behavior. And I knew... You know, I also have a lot of alcoholism in my family. So I had this sense that if I went there, I would lose the good girl image. Mm-hmm. I could do this other thing, and it actually kind of led me to the good girl image. Now, I'm, I'm jumping all around because I want people to read the book, Thick in the Water. But you talked about, uh, you know, always striving for perfection. Yeah. But you said Jamie Foxx taught you a very valuable lesson. Yeah. Can you explain what that was? Yeah, I think Jamie, I mean, I, I've i been really lucky. I've been lucky enough to work with Jamie twice on Ray and Django, Django. Unchained. Um, Classics, but, by the way. Both yeah, ones. truly. Um, he's, he's the best. Um, and Jamie's taught me a lot about a lot of things, but one of the things is in my work as an actor, to you have to let go of that perfection idea. Because we were doing a scene together in Ray. It was the scene where I find, speaking of drugs, where I find all his heroin works um, the first time as his wife. And, you know, we had done it in the morning. We had hit it out of the park. And I was like, oh, we are on fire. This mm-hmm. is incredible. And then as the day went on, I kept trying to do it exactly the way we had done it earlier that morning so that it would be in that perfect place that mm-hmm. it felt so good. And right. that's the beginning of death as an actor. Like, mm-hmm. you, you can't try to recreate magic, you have to keep cultivating new magic, Mm -hmm. right? Like you have to truly be in the moment. And Jamie really helped me to realize I was frustrated in the scene and he was like, you gotta, you gotta keep digging. You gotta let go of this morning. And that was a really powerful lesson. Why was it easier to find that in acting as opposed to real life? Well, I guess I hadn't learned how to apply that to the rest of my world. You know, there was like, it was in a vacuum, was isolated kind of moment. But it's yeah. a good question. I mean, that is the lesson, though, right? Mm-hmm. Is that, like, the answer is never about perfection. It's always about, like, what's the best possible version of my life in this moment, mm-hmm. of me in this moment. I was going to ask, what, you know, with, with doing this book, what made you finally say, you know what, I'm ready to open up? Because you, you've always been so private about I your know. life other than acting. What said? What was the moment you says, this is why I want to do it and this is why I want to do it now? I think... Part of it, honestly, is that um, I have been always very private with my kids, Mm -hmm. very private with my husband. We, you know, we don't put our kids online. We don't really talk about our marriage on the Internet, but or in the press. But I've been very public in my relationship with my parents. Mm -hmm. My parents come to premieres. They come to award shows, fashion shows, red carpets, magazines. So suddenly I felt like when they gave me this information and they asked me not to share it, I was now being complicit in their lie. Mm. Like they had built this false narrative and now they were asking me to buy into it. And I was like, I don't want to be out in the world doing an interview where people are like, oh, wow, your son looks so much like your dad, which, by the way, he weirdly does. (laughs) Um, And not be able to be honest. Right. Like I just wanted I wanted to be able to have my truth and not feel like I had to live under their shadow. Um, And I felt like if somebody's going to tell this story, I want to tell it because it's my story. So I didn't want to. Just do it on a talk show. Or I, I wanted to really have the narrative. Now, you did say something. I heard you say that uh, parents do the best that they can. Mm-hmm. And then it's up to us to parent ourselves after that. Mm-hmm. Explain that. Well, I think, like, one of the things that I've truly come to terms with in writing this book is that my every choice my parents made was out of love. They weren't trying to be cruel. They weren't trying to hurt me. They really thought that this was the best choice. And, by the way, doctors back then said it, like, Artificial insemination was so new. They would say, you do this thing, and then you go home and have sex. And then you have plausible deniability. And nobody knew 40 years ago there would be these home tests, 23 and Ancestry. Mm -hmm. You you had no idea. So they were like, go home and have sex. Then the kid's yours. End of story. Nothing to talk about, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think my parents didn't want me to feel different. They didn't want me to feel weird. They didn't want me, ironically, they didn't want me to feel distance from them, even though that's what wound up happening. So I know that they made loving choices or choices out of love, even if they didn't feel loving to me. Um, But I think we have to, for me and my journey, it's been like, it's been good to understand who they were, to have compassion for their choices, but I can't blame them for where I am now. Like now that I have awareness, I have to say like, okay, they gave me everything they could with as much love as they could. 
in the places where I feel like I don't have the tools that I needed, I didn't get the tools I needed in that household, part of being an adult is to say, how do I give myself those tools? Right. How mm -hmm. do I ask for help in therapy, in you know, reading, coaches? Like, How do I now close the gap between what they gave me and what I need? That's my responsibility as an adult. If I just sit here and continue to complain about what they didn't give me, then I'm keeping myself a child. Mm. What's, what that, oh, I'm sorry. What's, what's that conversation like with your kids? Like once yeah. you decided to take this world to your kids and even deciding to write the book and now you're, you know, because your kids, I'm sure they're friends and everybody knows who you are. So yeah. how do you have that conversation with them and kind of how are they responding to things? You know, it's funny. Like I was saying before, this is so common now. Like it's not news to my kids. They right. were they were so unimpressed. <laughs> like, you know, they're in their classes. They have kids with two dads and two moms. So they have friends from sperm donors, friends from egg donors, friends who are adopted, friends who were born from surrogates. Like they, they also like we're a blended family, right? Their mm -hmm. big sister, you know, when it, when we look at the three of them, their big sister has four parents. Like having me having another parental figure in my story is not weird to them. For my parents, they came from a world where what makes a family was very different. But right. the ideas of what makes a family now is much more open. So, you know, they they know, obviously the conversation I have with my 17-year-old is very different than the conversation I have with my six-year-old. Mm -hmm. Right. But, you know, I'm we, I want to be a home where we're open and honest and where they feel like they can ask anything. Mm -hmm. What about when you decided to, because I know in this book you talk about the abortion that you had at 20. Yeah. That is something that is like in so in my 20s. In your 20s. I, yeah, yeah. But I mean it's around save the last dance time, right? Yeah. So you are, you know, highly successful at this time when you I know, but it's in a chapter that I call black famous because right. I was but, like I mean, <laughs> you know how we are. Yeah. Like white people didn't necessarily know that the girl from Save the Last Dance was the same girl from Ray was the same girl from Last King of Scotland. Right. So mm -hmm. we knew. I you know, but so yes, I was uh, my star was on the rise, but it wasn't I wasn't like I could still go to the grocery store and it was all good. You Do know? you remember the next, like, because I know that there's probably like a lot of like medicine and different things that you take when all that's happening. But yeah. when you really were able to like sit and talk to yourself after that, what mm. was the conversation you had with yourself? After my abortion? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's such a great question. I don't remember. I don't remember. I mean... Are you asking in terms of like how did I feel about making that choice? Yes, because I think prior to making the choice, maybe it's different after, right? Yeah. Or maybe it's not. I don't know. But yeah. I'm just wondering. I never questioned whether or not it was the right choice. It didn't feel easy. Um, but I mean, to be honest, I remember feeling really grateful that I was able to make that choice because I knew that that would have had a huge impact on my life, on my career, on my mental health. I knew I wasn't ready. And I felt really lucky to live in a country where I had the right to make that choice, where I had agency, free agency over my body and could, you know, make decisions about my family and my family planning that were the healthiest decisions for me. My and how things have changed in this country. Yeah, that's one of the reasons yeah. why I shared it, because I feel like those rights are under attack and you know, in that moment, I talk about it as a, a loss of personal privacy because I got rec Even though I went to the abortion clinic under a pseudonym, under a fake name, I got recognized so on the really table. So you really did that? Yeah. Yeah. And so, and for me, it was like I had a sense of the loss of my privacy in that room. And that's what's happening to so many women right now. Like the, the right to have an abortion is part of our right to privacy. And when we attack a woman's ability to make choices about her own life, that are not anybody else's business, we really chip away at her ability to be a full human being. Mm -hmm. right. I, I, want, I want to ask one more question about uh, your, your father. How, how did finding out your father wasn't your biological father change your views on parenthood? Oh, man. Well, one thing I say in the book is, and it's what I feel, is that, you know, in a community, in our community, where people have historically had such difficult relationships, right, where there's this history of dads maybe not being present. Um, you know, in the neighborhood that I grew up in, I grew up in one of the few households where the dad was around and, you know, my parents were still married. And, and the fact, looking back, that that my dad really did choose me, that he mm -hmm. was there, he's been there for me the whole time, that he's been this, you know, parental force in my life, that he's my dad, that he chose me, that I belong to him and he belongs to me. 
it almost meant more than it ever did before. Mm. Um, and I feel really grateful, mm -hmm. you know, because the, back then when I think about the mid 70s and, you know, a lot of even today, like people not being able to have a baby breaks a lot of marriages up, mm -hmm. right? Like a lot of people, they don't make it through that hurdle or over that hurdle is the right metaphor. But my parents, they like, they made the choice. They wanted me so badly. They made the choice to, to take on this incredible risk and do something mm -hmm. that nobody else was doing and to keep a four decade secret because mm -hmm. they just, they really wanted me in their life. And so I think as a parent, it makes me, just remember not to take any moment for granted wow. as a parent. Like that each one of us, I know this sounds so hokey, but like each one of us really is a miracle. You know, mm -hmm. like the odds of like that egg being in the right place at the right time mm, with yeah. that sperm yeah. and making it happen. Like every single one of us from the moment we arrive, we're a miracle. But for my parents, I was like this crazy prayed for miracle. And I, I just, I want to make sure, you know, there may be a lot of things that I don't agree with in terms of the choices that my parents made. But the fact that I knew I was loved and wanted is something that I tried to take from my experience as a child and, and put it in my kids' lives. And, okay. and it's safe to say that culture of secrecy mm. that, that so many black families have, you, you don't have that in yours. I mean, I think we're really chipping away at it. I mean, mm. I, it's funny. My mom says, we were doing an interview the other day, and they said, like, what's changed? What's the family like now? And I said, we're much more open. We're much more honest. And she said, I thought it was so beautifully put, we're no longer afraid to hurt each other, mm. Mm. right? Because that's part of intimacy is to take the risk to be yourself, to maybe not agree, to say something that might hurt somebody, but you choose to be in truth no matter what. So yeah, there's a lot more transparency in my in my family now. That's now you, con level. you contemplated suicide at one point. Yeah. The reason I ask is I'm sure there's people well, listening. Oh, you told a lot in this book. Some yes. kids. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. It's like I went from zero to 60. Yeah. No. Yeah. But you got to understand how, how good this is going to do for so many people because, like, we watch you, especially, like, with women. I know we watch you in the composure that you have, the way yeah. that you speak. To see that, like, you, you've you actually been through things and now you're at a place where you're able to talk about it and, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's going to give so many people that feeling of, like, okay, cool. I, I can do this. I got this. So I, was, I think yeah, it's I also asking, an yeah, important lesson. It. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it, there's also an important lesson I think in never comparing your insides with somebody else's outsides. Mm -hmm. Because you're right. Like from the outside, I felt like it was part of my job. Particularly, you know, like when Scandal first started, there was all this talk about how there hadn't been a black woman on network drama in almost 40 years and I had this sense that I was I wasn't just like making a show for my own success. It was for the culture. It was yes. like, it was bigger than me. And that's heavy. And so I didn't, I never wanted to be flawed because I felt like, I, you know, if I don't do this right, if we don't get this right, it'll be another 40 years before there's a black woman mm -hmm. on the air. And luckily, because audiences tuned in, that wasn't the case. You know, soon we had, you know, Cookie and we had Annalise on How to Get Away and we had all these other shows, even like Priyanka Chopra's show, right? Like suddenly black and brown girls were allowed to be the lead on these shows and so I felt like I had to maintain and before that before scandal there was always this sense that you had to maintain appearances and mm -hmm. I think I learned that from my parents too right because they were always maintaining appearances even though I didn't even know what was happening behind the curtain um but getting through it again was that asking for help well, I mean what, what got you there first of all and then how did you get through it because I'm sure there's there's people listening now that might be in that same zone and trying to work themselves through it every day so what got you to that point where you felt that way? And then how did you get over that obstacle? I mean, the biggest, when you say there might be people listening who feel that way, it's like my heart breaks because I just know how hard it is to feel that alone and that hopeless. So if anybody's listening and is feeling that way, the one thing I would say is to ask for help, mm -hmm. you know? is to really ask for help because you are you feel alone, but I guarantee you, you are not alone. That's right. Um, and for me, that was the big thing was, I mean, number one, it was the first time that I truly got on my knees and talked to God mm -hmm. and was like, I need help. <laughs> like, I don't, I, cause I felt like I really don't have any tools. I don't, I don't know what to do. So it was the first time that I think I humbled myself enough to feel like, there's there's got to be something bigger than me that points me in the direction of healing 
And I started reaching out. I went to therapy for the first time, group therapy, one-on-one. Like I just really started committing to trying to walk this road of healing. I swear by it. I swear by therapy. Yeah. I, I want. I love your self awareness. Did you realize you were black famous when you were black famous? Yeah. Or was that in hindsight? <laughs> no, in the moment. Because okay. because I knew, you know, it was like I knew I could walk down the street on. 57th and Madison and be fine. Mm-hmm. But if I was in the Bronx, it was like, right. oh my God, that's Chanel. <laughs> um, or like at the time I was a I was a substitute teacher in New York City Public Schools. That was one of my many side hustles when I was trying to make a living as an actor. And it was funny because I would get hired into the school and the principals who were white, you know, the principals, vice principals, they would be like, so nice to meet you, great. They bring mm-hmm. me to the classroom. They had no idea who I was. But then I would be asked to leave a school because by the second day, all the kids were cutting class to see, to see Chanel from Save the Last Dance mm-hmm. because they knew who I was because I was substitute teaching in Harlem. So it was like that dynamic. I understood that certain people knew who I was and other people didn't. Do What's, people, sorry, do people walk up to you and bust out in the moves from Save the Last Dance? <laughs> like, was that a thing then? Lord have mercy. Yes, I, I'm for sure. For that. sure it was a thing that, but even just yesterday I saw Kiki Palmer and she literally did like, the monologue from the movie that I do sitting in the clinic with my baby. I was like, how do you remember this, Kiki? She was like, that was my shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's more fulfilling, being black famous or white famous? I think you have to have both. Mm-hmm. That was one of the things that, that Chris Rock taught me. Mm-hmm. Like you just, you can never ever forget your core original first audience. That's you right. cannot, because that that other audience will come and go. There'll be ebbs and flows, but black people will hold you up throughout. If you if you stay with us, we stay with you. I feel like that's what made Scandal such a hit. Yes. Um, um, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were part of the birth of black Twitter mm-hmm. um, at the time. So I one of my best friends from high school, she's a brilliant social media person, Allison Peters. She actually convinced me to go on Twitter, and I was like, what, why, I don't know. And she was like, she had come out of Viacom and was like, it's really important, you need to do this. And she and I kind of talked, the, I mean, I, I talked Shonda Rhimes into talking the cast into being on Twitter, and we were one of the first shows to do live tweeting and to really have event television at a time where people were no longer watching shows in real time, unless it was like a basketball game. Mm-hmm. And so, that conversation around the show was our grassroots movement. Like Mm -hmm. we had black Twitter on fire. People like Oprah eventually were like, I only started watching Twitter because it's, I only started watching Scandal because it's the only thing people talked about on Thursday nights on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Um, So yes, in that first season, it was absolutely because black audiences, you know how culture follows us. Mm -hmm. So black audiences made it that you had to be there to tune in and suddenly it trickled out into the rest of, the world. How often do people come up to you to fix shit? Thinking that you can <laughs> think you really time. Olivia Pope. I can't ask about the dance, but you <laughs> can ask about the Olivia Pope <laughs> all the time. And to be honest, because the show was inspired by a real woman, Judy Smith, who's a real DC fixer who never slept with the president, but was a real fixer. And I have her on speed dial, so people also will come to me to get to her. Wow. Um, because they know she is truly able to fix stuff. Have you, have you needed her? I haven't needed her, but I've <laughs> sent other people to her. Gotcha. Yes, I, but I've talked to her. I mean, like, not not on like a I'm in jail. It's two a.m. Help me out. But like, you know, if there's a rollout of a movie and I'm like, I don't know, this director is a little bit of a problem. What do you think? You know, I've done, I've had those kind of conversations with her. Um, yeah, but people do. You know, it's funny. Like, it'll happen in political moments. Like, a lot of my political work now is inspired by the fact that. In 2016, the morning after the election, when that awful rapist, racist person was elected, that when I woke up all over social media, people were like, you have to save us. (laughs) What are you going to do? Please, Olivia Pope. And it was funny for a minute. And then I was like, we have a real problem in our culture because we... We don't realize that Olivia Pope is an imaginary character on mm-hmm. a television show and that every single person who wrote one of those tweets, they have more power than Olivia Pope because she can't vote. Mm-hmm. She can't register voters. She can't volunteer. She can't knock on doors. But it's like we've given our power over to imaginary people because we have this hero worship. Right. right. So we're not stepping into our power because we're looking for somebody else to solve our problems for us. So a lot of the work that I've been doing has been trying to figure out how to turn the spotlight that's on me onto those grassroots organizations mm-hmm. and people who are really doing the work. 
But when, when people saw you with uh, the vice president the other day, yeah, they probably was the they same. They went crazy. Thing. Yeah, she's yeah. back. She's back. She's, she's at back. the White House. Man. Yeah. What do you do to relax and release? I seen uh, I see a lot of videos of you doing yoga. Yes. I, I mean, you see you doing yoga on your head like like as a dance hall artist. Yes. But <laughs> what? So what do you do to release and relax? Yeah, I think it's a lot of I love Pilates. I love yoga. I honestly go for a lot of walks. Um, I do walking and hiking with my husband. Not in the and Bronx. I. No, not as I don't she live in the Bronx anymore. The Bronx. Okay. But I, I, I do. I, I mean, I do walk in the Bronx if I'm there. Um, well, like but in terms of in like, the Bronx, well, go ahead. don't don't shade the Bronx. The Bronx is a beautiful place. I don't even know if it's where, shade if it's facts. Where do you listen? The Bronx is a beautiful place to grow up. We love it, but where do you know? Do, don't don't go walk there. Why? What? I, I just oh, you didn't see that? That's the Bronx. That was the Bronx. That was the Bronx. That was the Bronx. Don't shade the Bronx. You turned to Cardi B just. I want to know people. I honestly maybe with Cardi B because I I don't know, but I want to know people where it's like we got to protect you at all costs, and I just don't know. Hilarious. Yes. But listen, I mean, I I I walk. I like to walk wherever I am. I feel like walking is part of how you acclimate to an environment. So. I always tell people, like, when I'm in a place filming, I warn security. Where's my security? Right? Yeah. I mean, I we walk. It's, I don't care where we are. I don't care if we're in Jamaica. I don't care if we're in the Bronx. I don't care if we're in Colombia. I shot a film in, in South America, in Colombia last year. We walk. I walk. It's part of how you ground yourself in where you are. And it's part of how I relax and mm -hmm. feel like I am where I am. Um, but also, honestly, just spending time with friends and family. Like, being with my kids, being mm -hmm. with my husband. Those are the, and I do a lot of walking and hiking with my husband. Those those are like, it's like part date night, part business meeting, part therapy session. Like, it's good. I, I got a couple more questions. You talking about traveling. In the Black Famous chapter, you talk about going to Africa. Yeah. To become African. How, yeah. how, how did that trip change you? Um, so I was filming Last King of Scotland. That mm -hmm. was my first time on the continent. And it was great because I do feel like sometimes as black people in America, we go to Africa with all these like, do I belong here? Do I feel at home? Like, what is my relationship here? And I just had to put all of that aside because my focus was on just kind of dropping in and becoming a Ugandan woman. Um, and I I really did feel at home there. Mm -hmm. I did, I felt, um, I felt so lucky to be able to be so immersed in the culture that I wasn't there like, you know, as a tourist, mm -hmm. you know? And I took a, when I was there, I don't know if you've heard about this experience. I, I It's not in the book, but we, we're hiking in the Ruanzori Mountains, which are the mountains that border Rwanda and Uganda. And it's where the only wild gorillas live. Um, and you can go out with a gorilla trekker and find the gorillas in the jungle and spend time with them. You go with like a tour guide and these trekkers and these guys with AK-47s just in case. Now and, you see um, why Charlamagne said the craziest people from the Bronx? <laughs> now, now I was just right. thinking like you really be walking People travel to the from all over the world. If I people gotta... travel from all over the world to have this experience because it it is it is one of the most intense spiritual experiences I've ever had. The second one is the my experience with the whales that I write about at the end mm -hmm. of the book. Mm -hmm. But it was like to be in the jungle, to be with these creatures and you realize we really do share like 97, 98% of our DNA with these animals. And they are, you start to think like, oh, they're so human, but no, like we are so gorilla. And the what the craziest thing that happened was when they give you this in, this uh, orientation in the morning, they're like, if a gorilla gets close to you and is looking at you, the most important thing to do is not run. You have to, to feel safe, act like a gorilla. So I was like, wait a second. I couldn't second. do that around the white people. Wait, wait a second. I'm <laughs> telling you that right now. I, 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 I was going to say, what, see, what, I, didn't I didn't hear it through that lens. Because mm -hmm. for me, I was like a young actor who had done animal exercises mm -hmm. at school. Like, mm -hmm. this was my opportunity. for This was my Meryl Streep moment. Oh, wow. So when the gorilla came <laughs> down the from the tree, from I was like, I squat down. I mean, everybody in my group was like, what is she? When I tell you <laughs> that is the best performance of my life, I was, I was the gorilla. The gorilla was me. I started, I picked off a leaf started chewing on it and we had the most incredible experience because this gorilla gorilla kept getting closer and closer to us and this little baby gorilla she was so curious she was like what we've never seen a human like, this. like we don't act like that <laughs> <laughs> no she was like that one's one of us but with clothes so what did the gorilla do we just they just they got closer the trekker said than they'd ever had a gorilla get to a group before i mean the guy with the ak-47 came right next to me because they were terrified but i was like don't stop don't stop what yeah, it was incredible. Were you the only person acting like a gorilla? Yeah. 
How you know they didn't tell, tell you that just to be funny? <laughs> yeah. Because, they know you that. because it, the experience that we got out of it. I mean, they said it to everybody in the group, but I was the best actor in the group. Gotcha, gotcha, yes. gotcha, gotcha. Wow. Gotcha. And that went the whales, because you, you mentioned the whales. Yeah. So I was kayaking with whales in Hawaii. Jesus Christ. And yeah, I wanted to. I believe you walk in the Bronx now. <laughs> yeah, I believe you. Yeah. 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 You just out here trying whales. stuff. Yeah, I Are do. Are you calling the Bronx the jungle? Yes. So yes. <laughs> Yes. Yes. <laughs> so I was kayaking with um, whales in Hawaii, and we had this incredible experience. It was just me and one other guide, and this uh, calf, a baby whale, jumped out of the water and landed so close to the kayak. But I think the mom was upset that the baby was being a little too playful, so she came around to swim under my kayak to warn me. And you know how if you're on the water and something like swims under the boat, your boat rises mm -hmm. and comes back down? Mm -hmm. This whale was the size of a school bus. So when she swam under me, my kayak went up and it just stayed up and up and up until she passed under me. And then she kind of turned and pulled her eye out of the water to look at me. And it's just, those are those moments where you just feel so, for me, where I felt so connected to nature, to the you know, to everything that has come before you, because this eye, this like giant eye, is taking me in and kind of warning me, like that's my kid, don't do the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. um, I started acting like a whale. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't. Um, so yeah, that was magical. That was really, really mm -hmm. magical. And I learned, you know, I was shaking for like two days, but I learned on the way back. I was talking to my guide and I was like, that was amazing to see the calf and the mom and the dad. And he said, um, no, 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 it's not the dad that with whales, when you see them in a group of three, that's not the father. That's actually the whale that wants to mate with her next year, that he, he accompanies her on the migration back home, almost like an act of chivalry to mm. prove himself like, I'm the man you want to get with next year. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Oh, I like the whale. I, I got, yeah. a, couple, I got yeah. a couple more questions because I know you got to go. In the chapter of Miracles, you talk about the indie film, Our Song. Yeah. And somebody labeled you, they just labeled you simply a miracle. Yeah. What kind of confidence did that give you? Oh, wow. Um, I don't know if it gave me confidence. I felt, um, I think it made me feel excited about the possibilities of what could come. But I remember feeling, and in some ways I still feel like, I don't know if I'll ever be as good as I was in that movie. Mm. Because I was so hungry. Mm -hmm. And it was like the first time, it was my first movie ever. And I felt like it was the first time with the history of everything we were talking about, you know, kind of all the mental health issues, you know, all the stuff that I've been dealing with. I always wanted to be somewhere else or be somebody else. But when I was making that movie, I finally felt like I was in my purpose. Like I was really exactly where I wanted to be. Um, I talk in the book about being a kid in the Bronx and we lived in the path of the of LaGuardia Airport. And so I would always see planes fly over our apartment when I was a kid and wish that I was on those planes going somewhere else, living somebody else's life. But when we shot our song, we were in Rockaway by Kennedy Airport. And so we would be we would see planes, we would see planes fly over. And I never wanted to be anywhere than where I was. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I think I felt seen when he said that. When he said I was a miracle, I was like, no, this opportunity mm -hmm. was miraculous. Wow. Yeah. When, when all of this is done, like mm -hmm. everybody gets the book, they get to read it. Everybody should get the book. Get Absolutely. the book. They I read the audio book. It's me in my own words. So that's fun. What is the, like the, the, the hug or the message that you want people to get from this book? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, I, I think, and this is something that I've written in the book, but there's a saying I heard a long time ago that I really love that we are as sick as our secrets. That's right. And that when, I think when we can let go of the things that keep our true selves hidden, we can let go of our shame. So I want people to know that you deserve to live in your truth and be in your truth. Not everybody has to know everything. Not everybody has to write a book and come on The Breakfast Club and talk about their suicide. Mm -hmm. But you deserve to be loved for who you are. So find those safe spaces. Maybe it's a pastor. Maybe it's a therapist. Maybe it's a best friend. Maybe it's a spouse. Trust yourself. Find those spaces. 
where you can really, really be yourself and be loved unconditionally. Because that was one of the things that I said to my dad. You know, I knew when my parents told me, I realized that they they had been living under this lie for so long that every time I had said I love you to my dad, whether it was conscious or unconscious, there must have been a part of him that thought, she loves me because she thinks I am her father. Wow. Wow. And there must have been a part of him that thought, if she knew I wasn't her father, maybe she won't love me. Mm. That's part of why they didn't tell me. And so I had the opportunity, once they gave me that truth, to actually, for the first time, love my father unconditionally. Mm. And that's what we all deserve. That's what we all want. Mm -hmm. We want to know that no matter what we do or how we act or what we've done in the past, that we're lovable Mm -hmm. and that we're loved. And I feel like my family's in that place now. But you only get there when you expose your truth, when you're vulnerable enough to show people who you are and they love you anyway, then you know that you are worthy of of unconditional love. But I think your father proved that, you know, just because you just because somebody provides sperm doesn't make them a father. Yeah, that's right. He's an actual yeah, father. Like he's I think there's a big truly, lesson to be learned. That's there. right. That's right. And it's even like people will say, like, well, do you know who your biological father is? And I'm still wrapping my head honestly around that language. Like I know that scientifically it's true, but I still refer to him as the donor. Because mm-hmm. I don't have a relationship with right. him. I don't know that he's a again, scientifically he's my father, but I have a dad. I love my dad. It's not it's not that it's an uncomplicated relationship. You know, I right. talk a lot about how complicated those relationships are. They're not perfect. I'm not perfect. But it's that ability to walk through hard things that builds real intimacy. So I think I just I want people to know that everybody deserves to be loved unconditionally, that you deserve to live in your truth and that we can do hard things even when we feel like we can't. If we align ourselves with the people who are really in our corner we can do hard things. Do you want to know who the donor is? I was literally about to ask I you that. I do. I'm really? searching. I'm looking. Mm-hmm. And again, not because I need a daddy, right? Like, I'm not looking for an emotional connection. I'm really open. I mean, I say that now. Who knows? When, once I, You never know. Like, he <laughs> could walk in the room and I could be like, ah! Um, but I think I'm just really curious about that 50% of me, that genetic 50% of me. Mm-hmm. I think there is a question. I know what I've gotten from my dad. I know from my dad I've gotten my sense of humor, my imagination, my belief in the impossible, my um, ability to tell a story. I know what I've gotten from my mom, my, my intellect, my um, intellectual curiosity, my grace, my compassion. I don't know what I've gotten from the donor. I'm curious mm-hmm. what part comes from him. And I'm curious just in terms of my medical history. I feel like I owe that to my kids, that mm-hmm. they should know where they come from. Um, but the emotional part of it, I'm open to let it be what it's going to be. Maybe it'll feel like I have additional family. Maybe it'll just feel like I have additional information. T- I feel good either way. Did you talk to your dad about that? About yeah, what was his I feeling did. about it? He wasn't thrilled. Yeah, I mean, I he be hasn't either, been yeah. thrilled about any of this, to be honest. You know, like even, you know, we had the big Robin Roberts special come on ABC the other night. I watched it with my parents. It was me and my husband and my parents, and we all watched it together. This has been a real healing process for for the four of us. And my dad still grapples with parts of it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, he also still, you know, I say this, when I called my dad and said, like, I talked to the doctor, we did the DNA test, doctor said that you are, there's a point zero 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 one chance that you're my biological father. He was like, there's a chance! <laughs> right? like, that's where his brain lives. And I love that about him. I love that he's like, until you find that guy, I'm the one. You can't say nothing to me. And I think I want him to know that even when I figure out who that guy is, he's the one. Right. Um, By the way, Mr. Earl already did the job. Yeah, that's about yeah, to that's say. Right. Mr. Earl and Ms. Valerie did the job. That's right. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. right. Yeah. That's 100%. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think it's just good to have more information. Right. And, I, and I want him to know also that he can do hard things, right? Mm-hmm. That like... His, he's proving to himself and seeing truly that he's loved unconditionally, that having this other information doesn't make me any less devoted to him. Absolutely. You know? can we, can we, oh, I was going to ask you, <laughs> when you do um, meet your other dad, is your- My donor. Your donor. Mm-hmm. Is your uh, mindset around, like, your thought about him, is it going to be different because it's like he, you know, just- gave the sperm and didn't really I mean I don't know if they're allowed to come back and try and figure out who they're who they listen you know when my I mean? parents did this it was the wild west no rules when he did this it was the wild west it's not like he was like 
in love with my mom, looked at me at the hospital and was like, yeah, for sure. she's ugly, I'm out. Like there was, there's no like, I don't feel rejected by him. He didn't sign up. When he did that, when he donated his sperm, he wasn't signing up to, to be, be in father. relationship. Mm -hmm. So I don't feel somehow toward him in that way. In fact, I feel some compassion that he might be like, I didn't sign up for this, you know? Yeah. I don't know. Let's, can we end with this? Uh, <laughs> it's something you said in the epilogue, and I feel like it can relate to so many people. You say, my life is not about my donor nor about my parents. My life is my own. Mm. What does that mean to you, and what could that mean to others? Yeah, so when my parents told me this information, I realized, because they had built this narrative, this false narrative about where I came from, I realized that in many ways, I had been the supporting character in their story, right? Like they were living this life, they were Earl and Valerie, parents of this beautiful child, successful middle-class black family. Like I was the supporting character in that fable. And when they gave me the truth, I felt like part of why I wanted to write the book was that it was time for me to step into being the lead character in the story of my life, mm -hmm. to not let my life belong to them, mm -hmm. to say like, I deserve to be on this journey, this quest, because I have my own story. Like, I get it, you had four decades of living this your way, but it's my turn to kind of take this narrative and figure out what my life means for me. So I do, I love my parents. I, I do love being a supporting character in their life, but that has to be a choice. I have right. to know that fundamentally my life is my own and that they, because I have the most incredible parents, they now have the opportunity and have allowed themselves to be supporting characters in my story. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what I've learned about parenting has been about that choice on their part mm -hmm. because they have allowed themselves to be supporting characters for me in this moment which is humbling for all of us, but them in particular, right? And as I look forward at my kids, I realize this is my moment. Like this mm -hmm. book, I am the protagonist of this book, but I'm also the supporting character in the story of my kids. And I want them to know that I have their back and that they have to live their own life. They shouldn't be living in the ways that make me comfortable. They shouldn't be making choices that are for my own good. They have to make the right choices for them in the way that I'm making the right choices for me now. Well, we appreciate you for joining us this morning. Thicker right, Than Water is out right now. Let's and we also got to say yes. thank you, too, because, you know, she, I was watching an interview, and she detailed her own rollout. So she had interviews with, uh, she's having with, with Tyler Perry, with uh, Gabrielle Union, and she picked the Breakfast Club. Yes. So I think I that's. Appreciate that. Well, come we really, see us really on tour. It. We're going to be in Chicago, D.C., um, Atlanta, L.A. I'm going to be in conversation with Gabrielle Union, Tyler Perry, Bellamy Young, Tony Goldwyn. It's an incredible lineup. So come see us out on the road. Get her out of here. She's holding in a cough. That's yeah. right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's Kerry Washington. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, freedom. Yes. It's freedom. the Breakfast Club. Good morning. Thank you. Wake that ass up. Uh, in the morning. The Breakfast Club.